with so many podcasts out there, shows can get lost in the shuffle. That's why we implore you to check out Too Many Captains. You can find us at a moviepodcast.com. Five unique takes on Hollywood movies and culture. Find us on Twitter at It's a Film Podcast. Check our intellectual deep dives into theatrical films. Find us on Instagram at Too Many Captains Productions. Unique takes on soundtracks. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Too Many Captains Productions. Find us at a moviepodcast.com on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play. And now, here comes a new episode of Collateral Cinema. I'm Bo Maddox. I'm Ashley Chancellor. And this is Collateral Cinema. Welcome to Collateral Cinema, the only movie podcast that matters, where we focus on good movies, bad movies, and everything else in between in the world of cinema. We are podcasting straight from somewhere in South Texas, and yes, my friends, we are a 420-friendly podcast. So whatever you have, be it bongs, be it blunts, be it joints, smoke it if you've got it, my friends. Oh yeah, smoke all of it, especially with this monstrosity of a movie. (laughs) <laughs> Holy fuck. Four hours of this. Man. Oh, dude. Yeah. But, you know, it's really not all that different from binge watching a TV series. It really isn't. And, of course, we're going to go ahead and, you know, tell everybody what we watched, which, of course, I mean, you know what we watched, everybody. We watched the Snyder cut of Justice League, Zack Snyder's actual vision. This vision of his is. A little on the pretentious side, yeah. but in the end, it was a fun movie. I mean... It was a blast. For me, it's pretty self-evident that this was not the original vision. I just I just don't think that that's the case. But I think that Zack Snyder had the opportunity of a couple years, a few years actually, because the original was in 2017, so... Uh, listening to years of criticism, I, I think he was able to just churn out a better product. Yeah, in the end, he was able to kind of refine everything that was in the theatrical cut. I mean, some of them might be a little over long, I feel. Yeah, in some ways, I, I don't feel like this needed to be four hours, but at the same time, I enjoy this format. Something that we're finding out more and more in the modern world of cinema is that, and in pop culture in general, is that people's attention spans are much larger than we've given them credit for. People don't mind listening to a three-hour Joe Rogan podcast, you know, or people don't mind binge-watching a Netflix series. Yeah, definitely. And it's not like there hasn't been movies that have a really, really long running time before. I mean, uh, Avengers Endgame was, of course, over three hours, like yeah. easily. And e- even going back to movies like The Decalogue, which is kind of seen as an important cinematic achievement, that's an almost five hour long uh, movie. It, yeah, it, that's told in several parts as well. It's kind of like a mini series in a lot of way. In a way, yeah, it kind of is, and it can honestly be shown on HBO as a mini series. I mean, it's divided in, into into parts, six parts. Yeah, right. And I think that some and of an the, epilogue. Oh yeah, and an epilogue, of course. I really think that you know the pacing was. Really, really good in certain scenes, but in others, just kind of slow to a fucking crawl. Yeah, I'll I'll go out and say overall, okay, this movie is an improvement. I'll eat my words. I think the Zack Snyder's Justice League is in every way an improvement over the original, besides just maybe a few things. 
A few things, yeah. I mean, if you've seen the 2017 Justice League, I mean, the changes are going to be just night and day yes. here. I mean, we're talking different color grading. We're yeah. talking different cinematography. A lot of the cinematography, to me, especially with all the slow-mo, which, oh, yeah, get ready for lots and lots of fucking slow-mo people. Like, <laughs> slow-mo everywhere. It is a little overused, or a lot overused, and it is a little over the top. Hell, it's why the fucking movie is four hours long. It's mostly just <laughs> all this goddamn slow motion, man. I mean, Honestly, fuck. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, don't get me wrong. It, it really was a lot of fun. I actually enjoyed watching this, and I watched it twice, once with you, and then afterwards, today, I watched it again. You watched it again today, the whole four hours. Yeah, well, I was kind of falling asleep the first time. It was just, it was late, and it was a four-hour movie, and I hadn't really just prepared myself for it yet. Yeah. But, you know, when I got a chance to re-watch it today, I, I was able to really kind of glean the details from it. And I also watched the theatrical cut today, so I was able to compare and contrast the two of them. Uh, how did it really feel doing a rewatch of the Snyder Cut? How, how did that actually feel? Was it a better experience the second time? Yeah. Or, like, how so? Well, for me in particular, again, I'd gotten a chance to watch the theatrical cut. Yeah. Just the same day, right? And then I watched the Snyder Cut again. And so I was really able to appreciate the difference between the two movies. And you would think it felt a little repetitive to watch the movie and then watch it again. Basically watch the movie three times in a row. But that wouldn't be an fair assessment of the situation. Zack Snyder's Justice League is a different movie. Absolutely. It's entirely different. It's different in tone. Different in characterization, different cinematography, as we just said. And it affects the continuity differently. Yeah. So as of right now, the official answer from Warner Brothers is that it's not canon. But I think due to the immense popularity, they're going to canonize it. You really think so? I definitely think so. I think this will become the canon version of Justice League. I could see that happening. I mean, especially... With, you know, how the overall narrative plays out over the four-hour period. Yeah, and we're not going to get into spoilers here. This is a, a spoiler-free at-the-movies review. But, I mean, we're, we, we are going to be able to tell you, as far as quality goes, this movie is, is an improvement over the original. Just net. It's an incredible improvement over the first movie. Yeah. I mean, the first movie, to me... I'm not going to lie. There's parts of it that are really good, and a lot of those parts translated well into this movie and were extended in certain areas. Like, the very first battle between Steppenwolf and the Amazonians. Like, that was present yeah. in the 2017 film, and it is honestly way, way, way better in this one. It has more impact. It has more stakes. I mean... It, it even has more stakes for Steppenwolf as a character. Yeah. Some scenes were expanded upon or extended, and some scenes were shot new entirely, and then some scenes were are, are new additions. Yeah. And, I mean, the new additions were not... Of course, we're not going to get into what those new additions are. If you've seen the movie, you know exactly what they are. Yeah. I mean... In many ways, it's not so much what Snyder added to this. It's what he took away from it, which, of course, is pretty much everything Whedon did. Yeah. Which, by the way, let's comment a little bit on the Whedon cut. I mean, what's your general take on that one? I don't hate it. I, I, I think it's all right. It's an okay movie. And in the past, my opinion was, you know, Zack Snyder, director of, Batman versus Superman. And, and I recently had the opportunity to watch the Ultimate Edition of that movie, by the way. Just going off on a little tangent here, but the Ultimate Edition is said to add a lot of much-needed context to the movie, and it, and it makes the movie a lot better. It does add some context to certain scenes, and the movie overall is less problematic, but the most problematic things about the movie are still in the movie. The Martha scene is still there. Batman <laughs> killing people is still there, and those All are my main two problems. 
Yeah, those were glaring problems, honestly. I mean, especially if you followed that character in any degree through the comics or through some of the other properties, you know, the movies and everything. Yeah. But anyway, what I was going to say was Zack Snyder, I, I never had a lot of faith in him that his original version of the movie was going to be better than what Whedon was able to cut because, I mean, leaving the controversy out of it and what may or may not have happened on set, I don't know the whole story. I'm not really going to speculate on it. But just from a purely directorial point of view, Whedon is the superior director. I mean, he did Avengers. He did Firefly. He did Lost. Yeah, he has pretty much been an icon of like geek cinema and TV for quite a few decades now. So Whedon knows what he's doing. Yeah. So we're talking about the director of Batman versus Superman versus the director of the Avengers. <laughs> so my original thought was that the reason that this that Justice League ended up being a mediocre movie and not a really poor movie like Batman versus Superman was that Whedon was able to kind of save it. <laughs> but in, in context now and in, in retrospect, you know, that was just the stance that I maintained then. I, I do think that this movie is better. I'll just, I'll say I'll attribute that to being able to wait and taking the criticism from the first movie and, and also just having more movie. You know, the four hours does, again, maybe it didn't need to be four hours and maybe they didn't use all of that time efficiently, but they were able to use the time for some much needed movie. <laughs> yeah storytelling but i mean it brings up a point about Zack snyder as a director is that it seems like there's a little bit of a pattern here especially with batman and superman where you kind of have to go back and pretty much have a director's cut in order to really you know get everything out of it you know yeah and I, I don't know if that's you know the studios fucking him over or if that's him himself screw you know screwing himself over but I mean, it's not entirely a pattern right out of the get-go, but it's what's always made Zack Snyder so, you know, sketchy as a filmmaker to me. I mean, yeah. he knows to a degree how to shoot certain scenes and how to, you know, construct certain lines of dialogue in, in a way, but in, in other ways, like, I mean, there's some pacing issues, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's characterization issues like like, you know, this is the whole save Martha scene, you know, that was so wonky that, you know, it just doesn't lend well to the narrative that he was trying to put forth. You know, Snyder has this quality that makes me want to like his movies. You know, I'm sitting and I'm watching Man of Steel, for instance, and I and I got a chance to kind of rewatch the DCEU recently in preparation for this episode. But watching man of steel again i noticed a lot more of the flaws and i i just really wanted to like it and i did i i think overall the movie was was pretty good but it wasn't as good as i remembered it being and, and i i think the first half was just felt very rushed and then the second half was pretty much perfect in terms of pacing and then batman versus superman there were things i wanted to like about it you know and the same thing with the, the theatrical cut of Justice League. Yeah. I mean, the theatrical cut of Justice League, one of the biggest things I take away from that is that every time I see it, every time that I try to even <laughs> watch a single scene, it just looks worse every time. <laughs> and I really don't know if that's attributable to Whedon or to Snyder. Maybe neither. Maybe it's clashing of the directorial styles maybe you know i mean we're talking about you know Zack snyder he's supposed to be like this dark and brooding auteur and then you have joss whedon who is you know has a lot more of an upbeat real pop cultural style to his writing and his uh, filmmaking and everything and yeah i mean i can see how that doesn't mesh well you know i mean snyder I don't want to say that he's one note, but he does kind of go towards a very specific, you know, goal with his filmmaking. And 
maybe <laughs> that's kind of the point, though. Because for so long, I didn't get the hashtag Snyder Cut campaign. I was like, why would you think Snyder's original version was going to be better than Whedon's? And then I, I really got to thinking about it. And it's not so much that people thought it was going to be better necessarily, but just that he deserved the chance to make that happen. I mean, with the horrible tragedy it went through during yeah. the filming of the original Justice League, you know? Yeah, that was a very, very terrible event. Of course, he lost his daughter. Very, yeah. very sad. And at the end of this movie, we will say he does dedicate it to his daughter. Which Yeah, it was which, really, really sweet. Yeah, yeah, which really makes it difficult to really criticize it. Right? You don't want to rag bit. on the guy. Yeah, because he, he obviously, I mean, he wanted to complete his vision and also he wanted to honor his daughter. So, yeah. I mean, and it's great that he was able to do that. I think that's what's important here. That's what's at stake is can we see his original vision because it deserves to be out there. I think that was the idea behind the movement was, you know, he deserves the right to complete his movie as he saw fit for better or for worse, you know? And in he, this case, it ended up being better because he had more time to develop it. Yeah, but let's not act like the whole release the Snyder Cut movement wasn't a little toxic in certain ways. I it mean, was, but... Look, you know, it happened. The fans made this happen. Yeah, and I guess that we could take this as a win to a degree. But, I mean, just given how fandom can be online, especially on Twitter, I mean, maybe it's a little bit of a slippery slope towards, you know, just overall bullying campaigns. Let's let's not forget about some of the stuff that happened around, like, say, the recent Star Wars movies and all the nonsense that went on with that. Yeah, fans can be bad. I'll, I'll tell you what. I don't think that, that things should always be what the fans ask for because sometimes what the fans want is fucking stupid. Look at some of the WandaVision theories that, are, that were out there that people expected to be in WandaVision. And because it didn't happen, they're suddenly mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never understood that whole thing. I mean, come on, dude. They're just fan theories, people. Come on now. Right. So, I mean, sometimes, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, if we did things the way you wanted them, it'd be fucking stupid. I'm like, I'm glad you're not writing this show. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, man. Like, really. <laughs> but release the Snyder Cut was more of a movement of not injecting your own desires on what the film should be or it, it's just saying the original version deserves to be there and i think that we're all a little bit better off i mean i'm going to admit that much we're better yeah. off for having this movie out there yeah i think you know because like, like i said the 2017 movie it's just so forgettable in so many ways like, even the really, really good scenes become forgettable just by proxy. Yeah. And this movie kind of salvaged that. It salvaged all the good scenes that were in the movie, expanded upon them, expanded upon the actual characterizations and their backstories and everything. And they didn't, you know, bloat it with a bunch of bull crap. you know what I yeah. mean? Or... Like, with a bunch of the humor that Whedon is known for, it was just too out of place in the original movie. It felt too, too juxtaposed. It, it, it yeah. ran into some of the same problems Suicide Squad did with not knowing its own genre. Yeah, and a lot of that was, you know, Whedon trying to force it into the more MCU feel when that's just not what the DCEU is. Right. I mean, the DCEU has its up beat moments and everything it has your bird of prey your shazam and stuff like that yeah but i mean for the most part i mean the snyder movies really set the tone for all of that they, they did i mean the entire tone of the entire franchise or I, I should say this universe started off from the directorial style in man of steel and, and then batman versus superman i would go so far as to say that because Snyder's movies set the tone, that contributed a whole hell of a lot to the problems with Suicide Squad. 
Yeah. Because it felt like Suicide Squad was kind of like Justice League. It was trying to have its cake and eat it, too. It was trying to be a dark and brooding movie, but also a very funny and colorful movie at the same time, and it just clashed too much. Yeah, they wanted to put Guardians of the Galaxy in the Snyderverse. And along it, along with a good dose of like Joel Schumacher style filmmaking, you know? Yeah. Like, there was something very Schumacher-esque about <laughs> Suicide Squad that was, I mean, sometimes it's fun, but other times it's just disconcerting, you know? No, I defend Justice League. That's no secret. We did a, a whole review on it early last season. You're talking about Suicide Squad, right? Yeah. You said Justice League. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm high. Uh, you, you know I'm probably not going to do a whole full edit on this episode and release it as soon as possible, right? Fuck it. Fuck it. <laughs> All righty. Timing, um, timing is of the essence here, so, you know. Okay. Y'all know that if, if y'all listen, anyone that listens to the podcast will know that I've defended Suicide Squad, and I'll, I'll call it a guilty pleasure. That's fair enough. There are things that I like about about it that are enough to make the experience enjoyable for me but i'm in, i'm willing to admit that there are problems especially with the continuity of the cinematic universe overall because to have for instance the quality of the MCU which is what they're they're, they're trying to emulate here they're trying to emulate the MCU with the DCEU you know there, there's just so much care put into it well i would like to say that maybe maybe this movie the Snyder Cut it's kind of a refutation of that whole marvelization of the DCEU right. you know what I mean it, it's it's kind of a rebuke of that it's, it's finally kind of taking it away from you know the Whedon shit and you know trying to make it something all its own you know, I think that he really actually nailed it here to a degree. Right. No, I, I definitely think so. And in fact, I don't think there are any continuity errors with the movie. And so far, anyways, like like I said, my theory is that it'll be the canon version. But even if it's not, as of the current set of movies, I, I don't know of any glaring continuity errors so that I wouldn't make this part of my rotation if I'm if I'm doing a watch through of the DCEU. Yeah, definitely. I think that we should talk a little bit about Jared Leto because he is in this movie. That is something that was featured in the trailer of uh, the Justice League recently. That's right. There, there was promotional material. There, for there's that. promotional material for that, so that's not a spoiler. But, I mean, what did you think of Leto's Joker kind of getting a little bit of a reintroduction here? Like, what did you think of it? In a lot of ways, it, it, it feels like he's trying to emulate Ledger a little bit. Yeah. And, and then that clashes with Leto's previous portrayal of, of the character. But in, in much the same way that the Snyder Cut is, a, is an improvement on Justice League, I think this version of Leto's Joker is an improvement over the previous iteration because... There were things I liked about the heart that he put into the performance. It's just that m maybe he wasn't written as well. No, it wasn't so much that he wasn't written as well as that he wasn't directed as well there. That, yeah. I, I think that that's uh, very much on David Ayers. Because I think it, it was an interesting portrayal, the whole gangster vibe. I mean, I, I, I kind of dig it. But here it's kind of dialed back a little more. It's yes. a little more of a subtle portrayal. All of that is gone. All, All the gangster stuff is gone. It's just, you know. <laughs> yeah. Although I won't say what it is. There's maybe a little bit of an allusion to the ending of Suicide Squad with Joker. So I'm not, not going to get into that. But there's a little bit of a visual reference to that. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, sorry for the beeping if you hear it. <laughs> I, I don't know what that is. It, it's something in my room. But, yeah, I think that Leto's Joker in this particular context is a little more likable to me. Yeah. It almost kind of feels like it brings it back to what Joaquin Phoenix was trying to do. Yes, you're right. Because there is an actual line that apparently drove fans crazy. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I think I know what it is. We live in a society. We live in a society. We live in a society. Bottom text, everybody. <laughs> Slunk the gang weed. That's right. R slash gang weed. I love you guys. Straight up. We live in a society. 
Yeah, and also r slash movie circle jerk. Gotta love those guys as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am a redditor. You can find me on Reddit, Collateral Cinema. You slash Collateral Cinema. You can find us. But anyway, what did you think about just the team dynamics between all the Justice League characters? With better development with each an individual character i i think that the team dynamics were definitely improved as a result i mean the team dynamics in the whedon cut they were a lot more jokey right you know like we'll go ahead and tell everyone one scene that is completely gone from this is the lasso of truth scene where with uh, aquaman you know which one where he's like like diana slips uh the lasso of truth onto his leg I'm trying to remember and that's I just, that's that's in the whedon cut come on i now. just watched it today yeah well that's a scene that is completely cut from this movie and i can see why because it seems so out of place in the original movie it seemed very out of place yeah I'm, I'm struggling to remember that's weird yeah he's he's talking about like i'm scared like i think wonder woman is pretty hot oh like, yeah, 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 yeah 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 that that, that was cut i i think because a lot of the more campy, humorous dialogue was omitted. Ezra Miller's character is left intact. Barry Allen still retains most of his humorous dialogue. But a lot of the one-liners from Ben Affleck are gone. Oh, a lot of the one-liners. Batman does get a little bit more of a dignified portrayal here than in yeah. the Whedon cut. There, there's a scene in the Whedon cut where Batman's pretty much laid out on his ass. Yes. <laughs> and he's just like, oh, thank God, something stopped. It's like, I mean, I, I think it's uh, at the Return of Superman scene. Yeah. That, that was cut. I'm glad. In fact, the Return of Superman scene was done a little, just a little bit differently. Enough to make a difference. Yeah. But with just being a subtle change. Definitely. But the, the team dynamics, to me, in my opinion... It made everyone a lot more likable, especially the two breakout characters in this movie, which to me, the original breakout character from the first movie, Aquaman. Right. But Cyborg, he yes. is made into the most compelling character in this entire movie, probably in this entire cinematic universe. I was super glad for the extra background in, into cyborg's character yeah i mean and it was important background because his story is so intrinsic to you know what happens with superman and what happens you know with steppenwolf and everything it's it's very intrinsic to that and, and he really is the heart of the movie he is the heart of it yeah and he is the one that becomes like the catalyst for a lot of the more important scenes later on Right. And also, his father is more involved in this movie, and that was awesome to see. Yes. Like, of course, we won't say how, but yeah, his, his father plays a more prominent role here, and that's very much welcome. That's a good character. Yeah, I actually enjoyed the dynamic between him and his father a lot more here. Yeah, it's it's way better. It's It's gone into a little more, you know, uh, detail about it, more or less. Right. And overall, Cyborg's character has so much more depth to it. Yeah. Um, Wonder Woman's character is pretty much the same as always been. Like, right. I mean, uh, Gal Gadot, I mean, she knows how to pose. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be too mean to her. I mean, she can fuck herself for her views on Palestine. I and mean, we won't get too political there, but she can fuck herself on those views. But... I mean, as an actress, she's very hit or miss for me. There, there's some line delivery here where, you know, it sounds like she kind of gives a fuck. And then there's others where it's just like, you know, like, Kal-El, no. It's like, right. <laughs> I mean, come on, lady. You could do better than that. Yeah, some of the weaknesses of the original movie are still present as well. And I say that Wonder Woman is one of those weaknesses. Right. And honestly, I wasn't that huge of a fan of The Flash. I like I, him a lot. I like his character. He adds a lot of wit to the movie. Yeah, there's some wit to it, but there's just some moments where he just becomes a little too neurotic for my taste, and that becomes a little off-putting to me. <laughs> and Batman is portrayed 
you know, as a much older, more respectable type of Batman. I think. Yeah, I mean, they, they were going for like a grizzled Batman, a Batman that may have even sort of lost his way a little bit in Batman versus Superman, which yeah. is why I think Snyder allowed him to kill. I think it was supposed to represent that he abandoned the no kill rule, which makes that a little bit more OK, I guess. Yeah, I mean, if you see this movie, the the Snyder cut as kind of a redemption arc for Bruce Wayne and Batman, it actually makes a whole hell of a lot of sense. That's what I was going to say, but he's kind of played as a fool in the original, you know, we didn't cut out of the movie. Yeah, he, he is, like I said before, he is not given a dignified portrayal in that movie at all. Right. I mean, he's just kind of like the old fat Batman now. <laughs> yeah, he's this old, fat, uninterested. I mean, it didn't really particularly make Ben Affleck look all that great, but he looks a lot better in this movie. He's more yeah. involved. You know, he, he seems to have a little more life to him in this cut. Yeah, and then that's what I respect because it was contending along the trajectory that Snyder originally envisioned, I think. Yeah, I, I will say that part of the vision is intact. I, I, I think where the movie wanted to emphasize was part of the original vision, and I'll give him that. But we also got to talk about the other breakout character, the king of Broheim, the bro yes. of all bros. <laughs> Fuck it, Aquaman. The dude, dude bro. bro. The dude bro to end all dude bros, y'all. <laughs> like, seriously, I like his character. And his character is even better here because he seems to be a lot more empathetic. Yes. He, or he becomes more empathetic in, in the end, you know? Like, especially when he gets more involved with the whole plot with Steppenwolf and, and then la later on with, you know, Darkseid. Right. I mean, I think it was announced pretty early on that Darkseid was going to be in this movie. Right. No, no. And Darkseid yeah. plays very much the Thanos role, the kind of background character pulling the strings. And it, it honestly surprises me that he wasn't in the original theatrical cut of Justice League because the, I, I think it's a much needed element. The funny thing about that is technically Steppenwolf was supposed to be the Thanos of the original. But see, he's more like the pawn of Thanos. He's more like the Ronin. Yeah. Dark side is, is, is the real Thanos, the one who sits in the background for like three movies or so, you know, and, and yeah. all the other independent movies <laughs> <laughs> and, and doesn't come in till later. And when he comes in, I mean, it's actually pretty compelling. I mean, it adds a nice little layer of higher stakes to the whole movie that just wasn't really there in the original weeding cut. Right. And I th really think that, you know, he added a little bit to it. Yeah, and they even added kind of a subplot with that, you know? is setting up where the universe would have gone. And, and in my opinion, I think they're setting up for future movies. Because like I said, there aren't any continuity errors to my knowledge. So they could totally canonize this version. Because I heard somewhere that Aquaman and Shazam were written with the original Snyder cut in mind yeah. or, or what was, you know, what was written down before Whedon took over. I heard something about that. What I want to know is when are we getting a cyborg movie with Ray Fisher? Seriously. Cause you know, I mean, Ray Fisher had his own little controversies with WB and everything, accusations of some racism and whatnot, yeah. which, you know, definitely need to be addressed. And I think the best way to address that is let Zack Snyder make a cyborg movie with Ray Fisher. Yeah. I think that that would actually be the best next step, probably before a Justice League 2. Like, don't go into a Justice League 2. That's what I say. Don't go straight into it. No. That would be a mistake at this point. Slow burn. I think yeah. that's the point. I think that was the problem with Justice League. Maybe it was a little bit early. Yeah. Maybe we needed some more solo films. Because, again, we're, we're going off of the MCU model because that's the other cinematic universe model that's the direct competitor that ultimately, even if they're not trying to go for the directorial style of all those movies, that's the general structure they're, that they're going to emulate. And, and so if, if they had spent more time developing all of their characters, it would have been better. I think the whole Death of Superman thing was done too early. Way too early. Are you kidding? I yeah. mean, Batman versus Superman shouldn't have happened for another two or three movies. Yeah. Honestly. And... 
This movie, though, I mean, it, it's a course correction in many ways. And I would actually like to see more from this universe. I mean, it's piqued my interest now. I mean, DC movies were starting to kind of, you know, climb in quality a little bit there for, for a while. You know, post-Suicide Squad, at least. Yeah. It, it's funny because Batman versus Superman, to me, seems like it was kind of marketed as the counterpart of Civil War. And, and it's just so early for that. You need to be doing more independent films. Exactly. More solo movies. There should have been just a solo Batman movie in this universe. And I understand why they skipped it. Because we've seen Batman before. They kind of did what they, what they did with Spider-Man and just introduce him in a crossover movie. But I don't know. I, I feel like Batman's just so integral to the Justice League that he deserved his own solo movie in this universe. Yeah, he did. Not and to mention another character that shows up in this movie who we're not going to mention if you haven't seen it. But I don't know. I think that maybe we could start wrapping this up because, I mean, we're keeping things spoiler free here. Like, if, if we had a spoiler-heavy episode, we would probably go a lot more in-depth here. Yeah. Because this movie does deserve a deeper analysis, I think. I think so. I, I definitely think. Just like Avengers Endgame, I felt like that needed additional analysis that we weren't able to give in our spoiler-free review. Yeah, because we did that episode immediately after the movie had released and we watched it. Yeah. And, I mean... There was just so much that we had to hold back there. And that, that's very much the case here. So we're going to go ahead and do our final thoughts. And let's do a, a five-star rating for this movie. Ash, go ahead. Out of five? Ooh. Um, I'm going to give it a solid four out of five. Right on. So what are your final thoughts on the movie? Or, or maybe 4.5 out of five, you know? Yeah, there you go. Because I, I, I think it's... It's definitely the best thing to come out of the DCEU so far. I, I really mean that. Just with the ability to have more movie, even if it didn't need to be four hours, or even if some of those hours could have been managed more efficiently, having more time to set things up definitely helps. I would love to see this sort of thing, or hell, even the Avengers movies, as TV shows. I mean, I think that would be really interesting to have like a high budget Game of Thrones production value or, or the same production value they have as a TV series. Yeah. Can you imagine? It could have gone even more in depth with everything than it did just in these four hours. Yeah. Uh, my rating is going to go ahead and just be a straight four. Like. I'm not going to lie. I was not expecting a lot out of this. I was kind of expecting this to be trash. I was the but, same. Yeah, totally. that, That's why I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm very surprised. I mean, this is a massive improvement. I mean, I don't know if you could call this a great movie. But it's I an mean, improvement. It's an improvement. And for Zack Snyder, it certainly is a magnum opus for him. And I'm glad that he was able to come back after such a horrible tragedy and was able to finish this movie and dedicate it to his daughter. I mean, I like the characters a lot better here. You know, they're, they're not as interminable. Right. I mean, th the pacing issues are there, but it doesn't detract from the movie too much. Like... We ended up taking a little bit of an intermission, but it wasn't a very long intermission. Maybe no. five or ten minutes. You know, and this movie could be enjoyed that way with little breaks between each part. Yeah, you could totally stop between each part and take a break or, or even come back to it later on. You and know? if you're watching on HBO Max, which is the only place where it's legally available, there are little chapter markers as you're watching along. Yeah, and if you look around on social media, there's even some guides on the best times to take uh, breaks in the movie. Nice. I've, I've heard between part four and part five is the best time for an intermission. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. But yeah, four out of five. This movie pleasantly surprised me. I might even have a little more respect for Zack Snyder now as a filmmaker. Exactly. You know, I came into this with the same atti attitude that I exhibited earlier in the episode where I was saying, you know, how I felt about Zack Snyder as a director versus Joss Whedon. And now I respect him a lot more, I think, because 
I, I've gotten more time to really analyze this style, even after having, you know, just 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 after having rewatched the movies with additional context. Yeah. So I, I would recommend a DCEU rewatch, honestly. You know, and, and you can sit through Batman versus Superman. The Ultimate Edition is on HBO Max, and I will say it makes it more palatable. So, yeah, our general rating is a 4.5 out of 5, just kind of combining. Yeah, um, and that's yeah. a lot because just, Justice League would have been a 3 out of 5 for me. The, 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 the theatrical. Oh, Justice League would have been a 3.5 when I actually saw it back in the day, but... With every subsequent rewatch, it's just gotten worse. I would say it's a two out of five now. This point for you, yeah. Yeah, it, it loses points for me. Batman versus Superman is like a 1.5 out of five. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Ultimate Edition gets that too, I guess. Well, anyway, we're going to go ahead and wrap this special episode of Collateral Cinema up. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We do have a Patreon. We have film commentaries available right now. Our tiers start at $1 and go up to $5. We have more commentaries coming out. We have the Collateral Cinema Director's Cut, which we will be releasing at least one free commentary of a low-budget or maybe even public domain movie at least once oh, yeah. a month. And you can also find us on Spotify, on Podbean, on Apple Podcasts, on iHeartRadio, on YouTube, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Ash, you got anything to add for Collateral Gaming? Hell yeah. Well, we just released our episode on Metro Fusion, or part one, I should say. Part two will be coming out later this month. Um, and we're also going to be doing a bonus round focused on Metroid in between. Okay. And uh, we'll be doing kind of more of an Apex-focused bonus round as well, since we were originally going to talk about Apex, and we switched it to Fusion. But uh, we also just got out our Ghost of Sush our Ghost of Tsushima episode out last month. It's a tongue twister, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, it is when you're high and a little bit buzzed. <laughs> but all right, yeah, you can find Collateral Gaming at all the same places you can find Collateral Cinema. Right. Yeah. Wherever you listen to your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all Google that. Podcasts, YouTube, all of it. Yeah, yeah, Google um, Podcasts as well for us. And anything else to add? Uh, no. Go check out the Snyder Cut if you have HBO Max. Yes, definitely check this out. Like, go ahead and e even if you just get a little, you know, trial run for HBO Max just to watch this movie. Yeah. Like, yeah. And then do don't it. be daunted by the four hours. Think of it just like binging a TV show. Exactly. So with that, we're gonna get out of here. I'm Bo Maddox. I'm Ashley Chancellor. And this was Collateral Cinema. Check out the Snyder Cut, y'all. Laters. Collateral Cinema is an L Company production. All music and movie clips are owned by the respective creators and are used for educational purposes only. Please don't sue us. We're poor.